wait for a minute and then start. Okay, so I hope uh, everything is uh, everything is okay now, so I can start. Uh, hello here, everybody who's watching. Uh, I'm Andro Mihari. I'm working for Payara and uh, I'm a contributor, a committer to some Eclipse projects, uh, especially Jakarta EE specifications like um, messaging and batch. And I'm also a committer on MicroProfile. And um, I, I work with the uh, Payara community and support, support the community and customers who use Payara Enterprise. Um, uh, I'll, today I'll be talking about uh, how to develop Jakarta EE applications and, and get them to Kubernetes very fast. Uh, I will focus on, on getting the applications on Kubernetes. So we'll start with a simple example application composed of two services. And uh, let me get started. I'll, I'll first uh, explain what we want to achieve. The example is based on uh, on uh, first cup application. Andre, just to let you know, yeah. uh, you're not screen sharing yet. Yeah, uh, well, sorry for that. Oh, do I screen share? Yes. Uh, okay. So, okay. Uh, so let me jump, uh, jump to the uh, schema of the application. The application is based on uh, first cup uh, application from Java tutorial and the, uh, it contains two applications or two, two services. One is uh, front-end and another one is a, a separate service that um, computes uh, the age of, uh, of the Duke. So let me let me just quickly draw you the schema of the application. First, you have uh, a browser. So it's a browser-based application. You have to go to a URL to access it to, to see the front end. Uh, then you have um, the first top front end. And then you have uh, Duke service. This is a simplistic view of the application. Uh, when we'll draw the line, uh, request go from here and here, and here and here. This is uh, between the first cup and first cup front end and Duke service. Uh, there's there's a REST interface. So the first cup front end just calls a REST endpoint on the Duke's H service. What we actually want to achieve is not to run these uh, applications lo locally but we want to run them as uh, Docker containers in Kubernetes uh, and also be able to uh, scale them. So then we'll, we won't have just, or if, if we want, we won't uh, be able to just have one. Oops, sorry. What happens? Oh, so I'm sorry for that. I need to start from scratch, but it will be quick. So let's get here. And we want to it takes a while to copy an image. Oh, so the application doesn't doesn't pair with that very well. Okay, so I'll just uh, explain with my cursor and where it's. We want to create several instances of, uh, of Duke. Um, and we will need a load balancer between first cup frontend and multiple Duke services. The same will happen. Oh, this can be copied. No. I think I create, I, oh, this managed to copy correctly. I think I imported pretty big images. Oh, no. So back to square. 
square one. So if you want to if you want to scale the front end, we will also create a load balancer here and we'll have multiple multiple front end services. So in case there are multiple users, each of them can be routed to a different front end service. And each front end service will then go through load balancer and access one of the running Duke H uh, services. So this is what, what we want to achieve with Kubernetes and uh, basically achieve it very fast uh, without too much uh, boilerplate code and too much configuration. Um, so let's get on it. First, we'll, we'll start with a simple front end application. If you run it, uh, run it locally. First, I need to run run the service. We'll first run it locally and show what the service is about. So let's pretend that we already coded, spent a couple of hours of work to, to modify or to, to, to write a new application or modify an existing application to separate uh, uh, several microservices out of it. And then We'll run the service. I'm running it using Pyro Micro, uh, which is able to execute a WAR application from command line. And if we go here, we'll see there's There's a uh, Duke's H service running on 8080 port and provide it resident of providing a resident interface on web API Duke's H and Duke's H difference. These are two different endpoints that are accessible to other services. Uh, we can just try to see what, what happens if we call that endpoint. Against localhost. Um, okay, so we get just some JSON data uh, first uh, with two fields. One is H, which is actually the result we wanted. The second is the host uh, host IP address, which we will use later to demonstrate uh, auto uh, scaling that uh, the responses come from two, two different or more different services. Now it always comes from this service because we only have that one service. And the uh, front end will use that information, display the information basically. So we'll run the front ends to and that's what we where we need to be. Here. This, this is how it looks like, but we want to run. Um, let's it. Oh, it's 83. Uh, the Pyro Micro chooses the first available port, and since I have already run some things on other ports, it shows 8083. Um, so this is how the application looks like. Uh, so I've modified it slightly to. to, uh, to to make it look better, just a slightly better. Um, and it says Duke is 25 years old and it actually gets this number from the Duke's age service. You see uh, the end point is always, so this year it's always 25 or today. So today Duke is 25 years old, nice anniversary. And we will compare it to well, my birthday. So I'll just for data production, on <laughs> this big random random number uh, 179 let's say day oh, should be months so month is 10 20 
9079. And when we run it, we, we get uh, the, the comparison that we are 16 older than you. And there is also a database uh, to, for simplicity, it's just an embedded database uh, connected to or coupled to the front end, which stores the average uh, number of uh, age differences. And here we see that the Duke's age is running on, on IP address 127.0.1.1. So now we see that uh, uh, IP address that we uh, saw in the Duke's age response. So this is uh, the demo. Uh, and we want to, so we know disable notifications. Um, and we want to make it running in Kubernetes. So first, uh, I'll show you how I got it running on Pyra in the first place. It's not a big deal. Uh, the project is a uh, normal war, uh, war Maven project. Uh, to be able to run it just from command line or from NetMins ID, which uh, basically uses uh, Maven configuration to launch the application, we use Pyra Micro Maven plugin, specify the version of the Pyra runtime, uh, with these uh, options, option we specify that we want to choose any free available fort if eight, if the default 8080 is not available. So you saw it in action when it chose 8083. Uh, we disable clustering features because they just if if we don't use clustering, they just slow down the startup. And we specify which application to deploy for our, for development purposes. We'll deploy. Uh, the exploded up, uh, application. So that uh, changes in done in the IDE automatically propagate and Pyre Micro will re re redeploy the application. And we specify the context route. So uh, everything is uh, at the top level of the URL. There's no context route added to the URL to the application. Uh, now, the next step is to basically come to the, um, move this further away. Next step is to uh, come to the step where we define how to build a Docker container, a Docker image, and then Docker containers out of it. Um, there are two options right now, but I'm fo more comfortable with uh, wh what I'm showing you. Uh, I'll use uh, Maven Jib plugin, which is a plugin from Google to create Docker uh, Docker images and deploy them to a Docker repository without the Docker daemon installed. So you don't need any Docker daemon installed on your computer or your CI uh, system. Uh, you can just run Maven and it will create uh, the Docker image and uh, upload it to the specified Docker repository. So the, the side effect is that if you have Docker Daemon installed, it won't be in your uh, local repository, Docker Daemon. To, to launch it locally, you have to pull it from the from the repository, uh, which Jeep uses to deploy to, and then you can run the run the the, the container locally, and use the image locally. Um, Jeep is able to use the, the local Docker daemon, or even a remote Docker daemon, um, with another uh, another uh, Maven goal. Uh, this is mainly for development because in the, in the continuous integration systems, you would most probably want to uh, deploy to a Docker repository. It also allows uh, building a tar or a compressed compressed uh, image that you can import to any repository so you can build locally even if you don't have a docker daemon and then import this image to any docker repository manually if you want in practice uh, you would rarely use this option so i'll start with using this uh, plugin uh, this is a tip plugin and uh, I'll need version. I'll use the latest. And here we will need to specify configuration. 
and configuration just specifies basically what should be in the docker file you don't need or the docker image you don't need any docker file to do this uh, you just need to specify it here so we'll start with uh, specifying the image first uh, first is uh, the base image we will use uh, pyr micro docker image based on jdk 11 because this is in the docker hub and in the central docker repository we will prefix it with docker io and then point it to pyr micro uh, image and tag jdk 11 because we want to use jdk 11 the the default latest is based on jdk 8. Um, this is a nice uh, docker image provided by by the pyra team that you can use out of the box and you can just uh, drop uh, uh, your web application into it and run uh, we need to specify the resulting image and also the repository you want to store it to um, so we will use for now a place placeholder a variable docker registry which we will come back to later and then just for um, to make it things easier to remember and, and work with when you have a maven project we will use uh, the group id and artifact id as uh, as coordinates of the docker image and we will push push to the latest if you if you are going to use this in production like environments you would probably use uh, or increase this variable make it uh, configurable outside of the um, maven uh, pom file so we would uh, for example use version one or version zero one or just uh, use a variable um, image version and specify it uh, externally when you run the maven build but now we will work with uh, only the latest which is the default and then we need to specify some configuration for the pyra docker container which is specific uh, to pyra docker so first thing is still for for jip this is uh, uh how jip uh, treats uh, docker containers which deploy war applications so it it knows uh, that you are working with a web application because the type of your uh, maven project is war uh, so it knows how to handle the files generated by the maven build and it can provides you this up, uproot variable uh, where you can we can we specify where to copy the resulting artifacts to into the docker container so for docker docker pyr docker container according to the documentation uh, the deployments are by default in a prepared environment pre-created environment of pyr deployments and uh, if we deploy our application as uh, root.war it will automatically create, use context root slash the, the top level context root. We don't need to specify anything else. It's also possible to, to choose a different name and then specify context root uh, using arguments. But this is uh, rather simpler and also supported by older uh, by us by our micro versions. Uh, then you can see the pattern here. It's the same no cluster uh, we, we use the no cluster option here it doesn't matter if i use capital c or a small c paramicro doesn't care and then we deploy uh, the web application that we copied to this root uh, this one this time it's uh, a folder so uh, jeep uh, plugin will selectively copy only changed files from the exposed folder and uh, to save some some uploads uh, 
uh, when, when you need to do, uh, redeploy your Docker image. This is nice about JIP, which uh, is, contains a lot of intelligence in there. It, it's able to uh, do everything without the Docker daemon, so everything is in Java. There's no additional dependency. Uh, you only now have to know Maven uh, to use it and to configure. You don't need to use the Docker file. Everything is here. A lot of, uh, a lot of uh, what uh, you need is generated for you. Um, and it supports natively web applications uh, so that it uh, optimizes how the Docker image is uh, layered, how the files are layered. And it doesn't always overwrite the whole WAR file, only the files that, uh, that changed. So even if, even if you have a lot of libraries in your WAR file, it will copy the libraries only once and then use uh, this Docker image as a base for the next image. And then the next image will only uh, contain changed files on top of the previous Docker image. This saves a lot of upload time if you have bigger web application. Um, one thing that I uh, omitted from here is this auto bind HTTP because in, in Docker, I will use always the same port, which is 8080 and then bind it to something or Kubernetes will do it for us. So that's it for building the Docker container. And uh, I'll I structure it to my final POM a bit differently to separate the configuration from how the things are executed. Uh, so the main thing here is we, we only have configuration now. Uh, now we need to have execution to actually execute it. We can do it also from command line. So that's why I also separated the configuration and execution mm -hmm. because you can we can we can just run Maven chip build. This is the command or Maven go that will process all these options, will create a Docker image and push it to a Docker repository. Now we are, we are at Docker repository. Uh, the Docker repository should be the Docker repository accessible from the Kubernetes, ideally out of the box. For this demo, I will use uh, MicroKate as uh, Kubernetes uh, distribution, which runs locally on my machine. I already installed it. I won't go into details. I can show you uh, the page of micro KDS. Micro KDS IO. You can start here and install on any operating system. Uh, what is nice about it, it doesn't use uh, virtual machines, at least on Linux, it doesn't use virtual machines. It uh, uses uh, just Docker uh, to run the Kubernetes cluster, so it's very efficient. Uh, and it nicely integrates with the kubectl command. So now I, I just need to run um, to is okay, new window. And run kubectl uh, So we can we can easily uh, call kubectl. Uh, we just I just needed to modify the configuration of the kubectl command, which is generated by MicroKDS. So there is a command in MicroKDS that will provide you the the configuration. Uh, so we will show you uh, here. Um, A long command, so I took notes. Uh, oh, this one is not so so complicated. So you just need to run microkds config, and we'll 
generate the thing that you need to copy to a kubectl configuration file. And then you can use just kubectl as with any Kubernetes distribution. Uh, what's nice again about micro KDS is that uh, if you want to enable the dashboard uh, in Kubernetes, you just uh, use micro KDS enable dashboard and it will install everything for you. I already did it. You can also install the DNS server. Uh, we won't use it, but we will use the registry. So if we enable registry, we already did, so it's already enabled. Uh, but uh, so One, if we if we run micro the status, we will see that it's running, and all the add-ons we enabled, or they were enabled by default. So there's a dashboard, there's registry, and by default you can access the registry by by a URL, which is. Uh, localhost 32,000. So you can see there are already some, some Docker images in this repository. So what we will do is uh, we need to do two things. First, we will specify this Docker registry uh, variable to, the, to these, uh, um, it's not a URL, uh, but it's, it's a pointer to the micro is repository, localhost 32,000. Uh, it's um, edited in the main parent in the top level project because it applies to all the services. So what I did is I specified it as uh, this variable. And we also need to tell uh, Maven, the Maven plugin that it's insecure and that's okay because it's only for development. We just need to tell it's insecure because uh, this uh, Docker registry runs only using HTTP. There's no uh, SSL, no HTTPS. So if we don't specify this, uh, there you would see an error. We need to specifically uh, allow insecure Docker repositories. And now we can uh, build the image. So let's see if I can delete. No, I can't delete these. So I already deployed it to this repository. But what I'll do now is we will run chip build. This is everything we need to, to really build a Docker image and push it to the repository. If it was empty, you would now see a new image. We see that the images are already there. Um, but they are refreshed. Or specifically this one. If we go to the parent project and run the same command to build also for the other service, you will see that both are built. So we need to do this uh, for all our services um, to configure the JIP plugin. There's nothing specific because also the image name is derived from the Maven artifact, so we can basically s copy all the configuration or move it to the parent project to share it with all the services. 
that's very easy. Second step is uh, to specify the Kubernetes deployment. So now we have a Docker image. We can run each Docker image separately, uh, which is fairly easy, but I won't do it because uh, it's, uh, it would require some time that we don't have. Uh, and we, we would also need to uh, define how services see each other, how they uh, connect to each other. Uh, I'll jump now to the code. The only important line in the code is the, the line where the front end discovers or connects to the Duke's H service. So we have a Duke's H connector, which is a wrapper around the REST call, or all the REST calls to the Duke's H service. And it needs to know the URL, which it needs to, it should call. So in, in this case, in our case, we will read the base URL from an environment uh, variable. And then Duke's H URL. By default, if the environment variable doesn't exist, we will use localhost 8080, which is the, the our default configuration for the local environment. Oh, I noticed a question. Uh, how do I get started with Jakarta Standard? Um, okay, so. I'll quickly show what you need to, to build an application like this. Just two or three minutes. So the best uh, best way how to start with Jakarta E is go to Jakarta E web page. That's the main starting point uh, where you can find now now after some while. Uh, the, the Jakarta E page contains a lot of resources that weren't there. Um, and uh, the Eclipse Foundation is doing a very good job and all the Jakarta, all the people involved in Jakarta E are doing a very good job in aggregating all these resources. Sometimes they are not easy to find because there's a simply a lot of them. But I would point you to this resources documentation page which links to Jakarta E tutorial. And here is the Jakarta E first cup tutorial, which uh, I based my application on. And then there is a full-fledged uh, Jakarta E application called Cargo Tracker, which demonstrates a lot of uh, Jakarta E APIs. So I, I think almost all of them in just one application. So I would start by studying all these three. And uh, there's another question, how do I set it up on Cloud9? Cloud9 is, I think, and Cloud IDE. Um, that's uh, always specific to every IDE, but uh, I think it's good to start with the Maven projects and which most IDEs support in some way or another. Or, and when you want to start with Maven, there's uh, there's either um, Maven archetype, which I tend to, always tend to forget because uh, NetBeans ID uses it to generate uh, a new Jakarta E project, but I don't go into details and I just wait for the ID to generate a new Jakarta E project for me. So in, in uh, NetBeans, it's very easy. I just start with uh, uh, web application and it generates a web application for me. In rare cases when I need enterprise application, I will choose a different one. But when I establish that web application, it would generate an application similar to what I have now. With the dep no. uh, here. And let's see what's at the top. Oh no, everything is actually in the, the parent. Dependencies, yes, here. So basically 
every every Jakarta e Maven project should only have one single dependency, and that will be either Jakarta e Web API or Jakarta EE API. It depends on which profile, which subset of APIs you want to use in your application. Either it's a full one, Jakarta EE API, or a subset uh, of uh, which is called Web Profile. Some implementations of Jakarta EE only support this subset. Like for example, Pyre Micro, uh, which is somewhere in the middle, it supports all of the web profile and and a lot from the full profile, but not all of it. So it's safe uh, to start with web uh, profile, web API, and then add uh, individual APIs uh, to it. Actually, there's Pyre Micro archetype. If you go to Pyre Micro documentation. And here, here is how you would run it from command line. And that means ID and that means plugin from BioMicro uh, uses it to generate a new project. And it will generate a project that also contains uh, all the, the dependencies for the functionalities that are in BioMicro on top of uh, the web profile. So yeah, the best way to start is to first to learn on Jakarta E, I would start with uh, the Jakarta E tutorial in the documentation section and all the other tutorials. And then if you want to code in an IDE, it's probably best to start with an example application uh, from these tutorials. Or if you want to start from scratch, just use some generator. Uh, the standard one is uh, Maven Pro archetype. There are several archetypes uh, there are multiple implementations of, of the Jakarta e API. So for each implementation, there is uh, an archetype or some generator, but there are also generators for the vanilla plain Jakarta e. Well, and they will generate basically a project that contains only one single dependency. And all the rest is specific for, for Pyra, like, like this uh, bomb bill of materials which defines versions of all the components of, of Pyre if you want to include them in your project and compile against them. Okay, so I'll continue. Um, I'll continue with uh, how to deploy to Kubernetes. Traditionally, in, for Kubernetes, you would write YAML files, which are, yeah, quite quite easy to use for a simple ser service for simple configuration. You can see there is a definition of the service. There's a lot of boilerplate in there that just defines API versions and metadata. Um, you basically only need this is a special one. Uh, you basically for for your service, you basically just need to. Uh, what does it do? Does it work? Yeah, this is what I wanted. You basically just select you want to type load balancer to be able to access it through a load balancer, and with this Kubernetes will create a load balancer for you and point it to uh, the instances of your service. Then you need to specify which instances or where are the instances of your service. This is uh, by applying a selector. Here it's a pathfinder, but we will see it will be for, for our Duke's H service, it will be Duke's H. And, and then basically just a port. That's, that's a service with a load balancer, it's very simple. We want to have something like that for our uh, application. So let's go to the Duke's H service. And to do this, we will use um, Kubernetes Maven plugin. This was previously named Fabric 8 plugin. So for those who knew Fabric 8, uh, they will be familiar with this plugin too. Um, it contains two main goals. 
or it also contains a build call, which basically does the same thing as chip, but in a different way. And I already started using jib and, and like it, how it builds uh, the Docker images and uploads them to a Docker repository in one step. So uh, I chose to not change that and only use what I need from the Kubernetes Maven plugin. And basically what we need here is first to generate these YAML files, at least most, most of the content of these files, and then apply them, which basically means deploy everything to Kubernetes. We don't need to uh, build a Docker image because it's already built there and available in the Kubernetes, in the Docker repository that's available from Kubernetes. So let's see how we configure it. I don't have much time, so I will just go through what I already have. I thought I will have more time to type it, but uh, now I'll just go through what I already prepared. So for the Kubernetes, we need to specify, uh, first we need to specify the, the Docker repository. We already did it for, for the JIP plugin, but to do it, we did it in, in the Maven parent project. But to specify it also for the Kubernetes plugin, we need to redefine it as a jcube docker registry property, which points to the docker registry property that we defined before. So now both are the same. Only the first one is used by JIP, the second one is internally uh, picked up by the Kubernetes plugin, is not used in our POM XML file. This is to point also the Kubernetes Maven plugin to the uh, Docker repository that we have in MicroCadis. And uh, where are we? That's one thing we needed to do. Uh, just to be able to generate uh, the Kubernetes files that points to correct repository and correct, uh, uh, correct Docker images. So we only need to specify the Docker repository because Kubernetes Maven plugin is so nice that it's able to derive all the rest from the Maven configuration. So by default, it does the same what we did for JIP. It takes uh, the repository, uh, the, the, the property that we defined uh, as a repository. It will take the project group ID as uh, uh, the uh, and, and we'll gen use it to generate uh, the name of the image and also project artifact ID and it will use latest tag by default. There are, uh, you, can, you can override this, but this is the same default that works most of the time, at least for demo purposes. Um, so we won't need to change this. We only need to point it to the correct Docker registry. So we will really find this variable as the one is that's expected by the Kubernetes Maven plugin here, jcube docker registry. Um, another thing to, to change or to uh, what we want to do is, is to specify the type of the service to be a load balancer by default. If we don't do this, that's uh, Let's disable this and run the run name. Let's go to the TXH, the Maven Kubernetes resource. This will call the resource um, resource goal that generates the Kubernetes deployment files. And these are created in the target directory. Probably not where you would expect them, but it's pretty, pretty nice. And they will be in the classes directory. So they will end up as meta information inside your web application. So anybody who will open your web application bar package will, will see 
the intended deployment and can use it to deploy the Kubernetes. Uh, let's see, there is a deployment automatically generated, it contains a lot of metadata, but it's not very interesting. Uh, what's interesting and what's re really needed is this spec part. It specifies how many replicas, so how many instances of our service we want to use. And it specifies a, se a selector, which is uh, Updux age is the most important, but uh, it will also use uh, all these. So there are several, these are like tags that are used to find this uh, deployment when you create some other Kubernetes component that needs to refer to to a deployment. And there's another some metadata. And what is another thing that is interesting is uh, the containers used for the container image used for these uh, deployments. So in Kubernetes, you have deployments, but these, these are this, this uh, like aggregation of, of, of instances of one service. Uh, this is like a template. So um, this container defined here will be used to start any pod, any container within uh, defined by the deployment. So if you scale up to three services, it will launch three Docker containers based on this metadata and we will provide it with, with this configuration. So what it does, it again specifies some environment variables. It generates the image name for you, which, as I told you. It uses our Docker repository and then takes the, the Maven group uh, and Maven artifact ID and the latest tag. And uh, rest are the defaults. What is what is not very nice for us is this image pull policy, which because in development um, it would mean that if we redeploy uh, just uh, this Kubernetes uh, configuration uh, and we have a new Docker image under the same tag, the latest tag. So if we just override the existing Docker image in the Docker repository, and with this configuration, uh, the Docker image will be done only, only the first time it's needed, and then it won't get updated, even if we change our application. So we need to change this, and we will do it by setting the cube controller. Jcube controller, and we can also overwrite the replica count. It is, as to start with, it's just one. This is the default. But we will define the pull policy, which means that every time a new container is created, it will pull new, pull, pull the Docker image from the Docker repository. Uh, so if we update it in the Docker repository, uh, the Docker container will use the new version of Docker image, even if we don't change the tag. And we can like we will later play with replica count. And also we want to specify the service type, which is I will show you how the default service looks like. It doesn't oh does it specify the type kind kind service. No it doesn't doesn't specify the type, which by default means that the service is only available uh, within the cluster and we can't access it and there's no loan balancer to balance between multiple instances. So there can be only one instance uh, of, the, of the service. So now let's regenerate everything. And we'll see that what changed. Image pool policy changed. And the type, yeah, now, now we have this type load balancer, which means that Kubernetes will create a load balancer for us automatically. We will do something similar for both our services, for the front end and for the, the uh, Duke's H service. And we will deploy with uh, just uh, Kubernetes fly 
command. This will take the resources that were generated by the resource plugin or this resource goal and use the kubectl tool configured to, to point to our local micro KDS cluster and apply all these files. So when we go to the Kubernetes dashboards, now we see we have first cup war and Duke's age services. And when we go to deployments, each of the services points to the respective deployment. And then there are just two ports, one port for, for each service and deployment. But we can have multiple ports, which means multiple instances of the service. We'll come back to this. So, so to access our service, we can do two things. What to we can either use the port generated by Kubernetes, just to map to the front end. So we'll just use this. And hello, hello, voila, everything is working now. Um, it uh, the front end calls the back end service, the Duke's H service. It will retrieve the age of Duke. Will print the IP of the service. You see, if you remember, uh, previously on when we were lucky, running locally, it was one to seven point zero point one one. Now it's ten point something, and most mostly in Kubernetes, IP addresses start with ten. And now one thing, one more thing we did, uh, I did, which I didn't tell you, is I pointed pointed the front end to the back end. And this is uh, by uh, host name. And on localhost, it was always using localhost to point to the, to the external service. But now, if it would point to localhost, it wouldn't find anything because there's no Duke's H uh, service running on locally on the same, in the same container. It needs to use something in Kubernetes to find the other container. And that something is the service. So also this internal Duke service has a service in Kubernetes, which assigns it a host name and creates a, creates a load balancer. The services of type load balancer and the Kubernetes creates a host name in its internal DNS in service or um, so that when first cup accesses Duke's age, it will point it to the service and then we'll all balance it to uh, different uh, pods, different instances. So to do that, we need to do something to configure our Kubernetes Maven plugin. And this is a thing that's not possible in inside POMXML, but we will use another way how to configure this plugin with uh, a Kubernetes template file, which we can find in SRC. Uh, it needs to be in the first cup frontend. No, oh yeah, here it is. It's in main. And next to the Java directory, there's, we need to create jcube directory and the deployment YML file. It only contains the things that we need to overwrite or, or add to the generated uh, deployment file. So in our case, we need to specify Duke's H URL, which is read in this code here. And if we point it to Duke's H hostname and port 8080, which never changes, we will be able to point the front end to the back end. Otherwise it would use local host and we wouldn't find anything. So that's the only thing. If, if we go to the generated deployment file, you will see there's this variable defined, and all the doc containers from these deployments uh, will use this uh, variable defined, uh, Duke's H. So the final thing we can do now is we will scale the Duke's H deployment. Let's start three instances. If we go to 
parts we'll see that there are now multiple of them running multiple parts for duke's age and when we just go to Let's go to the Duke service. We define some date. You can see that the IP changes. So in the, now it's 0.61. And let me see what are the internal IP addresses. Fifty-six. Oh no! Now we get fifty-six. So you see, load balancer kits kicks in, and and the front end now doesn't know which service it, it will it will contact. It will contact the load balancer service within Kubernetes, and it will route it to one of the available services. That's it. I hope uh, now you will be able to understand how to quickly develop or quickly turn your applications to Kubernetes applications. There are some more things to study. First is how to operate with the Kubernetes cluster. I recommend using MicroKDS to, to learn how to work with uh, Kubernetes. Or if you have access to a cloud, to a Kubernetes installation in the cloud, uh, like uh, Microsoft Azure or OpenShift, uh, you can start with them. Um, you just need to install kubectl command and point it to your Kubernetes cluster. And uh, yeah, then then just go to study documentation of uh, the plugins that I mentioned. It's uh, um, it's micro case maven Kubernetes plugin. This one, and then there's uh, this uh, chip, chip plugin. That's basically it's when when you want to get started with Kubernetes very fast and with Jakarta E. Thanks for watching. Awesome, thank you, Andre. Uh, there was just one question that came in at the last minute. Is there any doc with steps until Kubernetes? Um, is there any, I don't see that question. Is there any, any what? Any doc, like document with steps until Kubernetes. Uh, how to get started with Kubernetes, you mean? Yeah, I'll just post um, the question in the chat. Um, if you want to get started with Kubernetes, um, yeah, the, there are a lot of resources. Uh, oh, that's a very short question. It might mean what I was talking about all the time, or it might mean how to get started just with Kubernetes without any Java application or anything specific uh, to your application. So since I talked about how to get your application running in Kubernetes, I assume that the question is about uh, from from what? Oh, so you mean document? If if there is any documentation for what I basically described, um, I don't think there is any specific uh, to cover all the pipeline, the whole pipeline. You can uh, uh, if uh, you use Pyre Micro or just want to get uh, started quickly with uh, Jakarta E, you can see the documentation of how to use docker and it's, uh, docker docker images so pyre, pyre micro and pyre server have both uh, docker images that are available for you and there's documentation how to use them and how you can specify configuration for these images um, if you want to get them running in Kubernetes, you basically just dockerize your application using Pyre Micro or 
or any other Jakarta implementation and then study how to just get running with Kubernetes. So yeah, that there's no no documentation I'm aware of how to do what I did in this talk. Uh, but maybe I'll put this into a blog post or several blog posts, but uh, I don't know if I will have time to describe everything in detail. Okay, answered. So this talk will be recorded, so probably just try to go through it and I will, or at the Eclipse Foundation will attach my uh, demonstration project to, to the recording. So I hope that you'll be able to go through it and, and see I, I have some documentation in, in the project and that would probably show you how to get uh, uh, do, do the steps I, I showed you here. But yeah, you, you have to you have to take the documentation pieces from here and there and first study how to dockerize your application and then how to use Kubernetes to uh, use your Docker images in, in a Kubernetes cluster and interconnect your services. Because the Kubernetes part is basically independent of Java or any application. It's just the Maven Kubernetes plugin makes it easy for Java developers to operate with the Kubernetes cluster and, and deploy application to it but you can study Kubernetes separately. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Andre, and uh, thank you for everyone who joined today. Okay, thank you very much to everybody. Bye. Bye.